There we go. All right. So, good morning, everyone. My name is Rebecca Antel. I'm the Youth Services Consultant for the South Carolina State Library. Thank you for joining us this morning. Um, we are offering this webinar as part of a project with the Network of National Libraries of Medicine. And our presenter this morning is Deborah Pettipan um, from MUSC. Um, I am very excited to hear this presentation. I think it's gonna be really interesting and I'm proud of you all for joining us the week before Thanksgiving. This is not, this is, most people would say this is bad timing to talk about nutrition. I would say it's very good timing to keep things in mind for the holiday season. So, um, Debbie, I am going to turn it over to you. Um, I will keep an eye on the chat. If anyone has questions, feel free to post things there. Um, and let's get started. Fantastic. Thank you, Rebecca. Can you see and hear everything okay? Okay, awesome. Thank you all so much for joining. I'm really excited about some of the nutrition education projects with the Charlie Carts that I've heard that you all are doing. And in general, you know, my understanding is that you all get a lot of nutrition questions just from your customers, if that's how you refer to them. And sometimes there's, there's a lot of information about nutrition out there, right? Like everybody eats, so everyone's an expert kind of thing. And there's a lot of misinformation. It's a confusing space to be in. My goal today is just to help share with you some kind of basic fundamentals, share with you some resources that you can go to, maybe uh, some tips that you can use in your personal life or easy things that you can share with others. And I'm a huge fan of libraries and librarians. My mom was one for her entire career. And I know the um, impact that you all can have on your community. And so I'm really excited to be able to share these resources with you. So without further ado, why are we talking about this? Because obviously nutrition and health are very related. We have so much chronic disease in our population, whether you're talking about cardiovascular disease or high blood pressure, type two diabetes, about half of all Americans have one or more of these nutrition related chronic diseases. And what's crazy about that is that, you know, we think that there's a lot of um, confusion around what makes for a healthy diet, but really nutrition professionals agree on 99% of what is the platform for a healthy diet. It's really, I think, just those couple other pieces of precision that we're trying to tease out that tends to make headlines and creates for a muddy, confusing landscape. In fact, we actually present the platform for what we know about healthy eating, all based on science and evidence, every five years through the Dietary Guidelines for Americans. So some of these images might be familiar to you. The Dietary Guidelines are um, created through USDA and Health and Human Services. It happens every five years by reviewing the literature, and then they publish updates, and they also translate that into recommendations that are consumer facing. So the most common or the current one is choosemyplate.gov is where you can find it, but it's the my plates on the bottom right corner of your um, screen. Most people remember the pyramid, like if you're old enough, um, we all remember the pyramid and people continue to get um, to reference that, even though it's been sort of phased out more than 15 years ago. But we do have these resources that we can point to. And again, the Dietary Guidelines for Americans, they're updated every five years. USDA then translates those recommendations into information that's intended for the consumer. And they publish all of that stuff here on this website, choosemyplate.gov. And the current recommendations are really designed to help Americans make shifts toward what the recommendations are. So today, as I, as I sort of mentioned already, we're gonna just do a high level overview of what the current Dietary Guidelines for Americans are. There's several different ways you can actually deploy those recommendations. So we're gonna talk about that. We're gonna talk about strategies for helping people shift choices within certain food groups and also from one food group to another. And we're gonna locate some resources that can help support the public's understanding. So the Dietary Guidelines for Americans have not one, 
not two, but three examples of healthy eating patterns that you can use that meet all of the current recommendations. And they're generally referred to as the US style or sort of kind of the common way people eat, the Mediterranean style and the vegetarian style. And what I wanna do is just quickly highlight some of the similarities and differences between them. So the dietary guidelines are, first of all, what we're looking at here is the number of servings that are recommended you eat based on a 2000 calorie diet. Now, some people are going to need more calories than that. If you're very physically active, um, men tend to get away with more calories than women do, et cetera. Some of us need less calories in a day. So our serving sizes are gonna be a little bit smaller, but in general, this is a really good reference. And you'll see that if the food group is bolded on the left, so that's our vegetables, our fruits, our grain, dairy, and protein, then across the top, you'll see the number of servings every day we're supposed to get. And we're gonna go through each one of these food groups um, separately. And then underneath some of the food groups, like the vegetables, for example, we have what we call subgroups. And these are the number of servings per week that we want to get out of these different subgroups. And I'm gonna um, highlight some of those subgroups when we move forward. But in general, they're very similar. There's just some minor tweaks from between the three different patterns, but this provides us with a roadmap to help figure out how to plan a healthy diet. Unfortunately, if we actually go out and take the data of what Americans are eating, and we do that, um, it is a report called What We Eat in America that is published, and we can actually break that down for women versus men, different age groups. I'm going to show you what some of that data looks like. But if we look at what Americans are currently eating compared to what we want them to eat, that um, chart that we were just looking at, Americans are not aligned with the dietary guidelines. So in this graph here, what you see is a center line. And the center line is really where we want folks to be eating. If the gold bar, if there's a gold bar, that's the percent of Americans that are off target. So for example, if we look at the vegetables, we see a very large gold bar to the left of the center line. That's the percent of Americans that are not getting in enough vegetables. Um, same with the fruit, that's the percent of people not getting enough fruit, et cetera. If we go down to the bottom three categories, the added sugar, saturated fat, and sodium, that gold bar to the right is the percent of people that are exceeding the limits that we recommend. So unfortunately, the data that we have right now shows that Americans are not um, aligned with the dietary guidelines. About three fourths has a pattern that's really low in vegetables, fruits, and dairy. More than half is meeting or exceeding the grain recommendations, but they're also not getting enough of the whole grains or the legumes that we want them to. We're gonna talk more about that later. And as we can see, they're exceeding the recommended limits for added sugar, saturated fat, and sodium. If we don't pick apart the different food groups, but we actually look at the dietary pattern as a whole, we can actually rank diet quality. We call that the healthy eating index or the HEI. And the higher the score, the healthier the overall eating pattern. And as you can see here, the healthy eating index score is um, not very high. We want it to be as close to 100 as possible. And it's kind of staying the same year over year. We're not really making progress in getting people's dietary patterns to improve. And the dietary pattern overall is actually really important because data shows that the pattern is more predictive of overall health and disease than an individual nutrient or an individual food. So we need to kind of rise above talking about just saturated fats or just vegetables and really start talking about patterns around how people are eating because that's more predictive of health and disease. So some of the things that you're gonna see in the dietary guidelines right now is that they're food-based and they're focused on patterns of food. They emphasize using nutrient dense foods. So these are foods that are not highly processed. They're low in added oil, added sugars and added salt. And we wanna use nutrient dense foods instead of unhealthy choices, not in addition to. So we wanna make some changes there. And again, they emphasize making shifts or substitutions. And we want to even make shifts from one food group to another, which I'll talk to you about. 
But probably the most important thing, and this is where your interaction is going to be really important, is we need to personalize what those recommended shifts are, because the most important thing is that they're shifts that stick over time. And that's going to be based on things like personal preference, what's available, seasonality, et cetera. So let's take a deeper dive into the different food groups. The vegetable food group, my personal favorite food group, no matter which of the example dietary patterns you're looking at, the dietary guidelines recommend two and a half cups of vegetables a day. And that is, again, a daily recommendation. Now, if we look at the subgroups, we have several different subgroups. Dark green leafy vegetables or dark green vegetables in general, that tends to be the group people think of as being the most important. And, in, and we do wanna make sure we're getting a minimum of one and a half cups per week of those. But look at the next group, that's our red and orange group. Dietary guidelines want five and a half cups of red and orange vegetables in a week. So think about what your options are there. So luckily this time of year, there's a lot. There's pumpkin, there's butternut squash, um, there's acorn squash. There's a lot of these winter vegetables, but other times of the year, we're kind of talking about red tomatoes, orange bell peppers, things that people don't necessarily get enough in. And the red and orange group is really important because our body takes that orange color, which comes from beta carotene, where we name the carrot the carrot, um, and converts it to vitamin A, which is really important for eye health and skin integrity. But if you look at this graph on the right, you can see that Americans are not eating enough vegetables. And let me just describe this graph because we're gonna see a lot of them. So there is the recommendation for females on the right and the recommendation for males on the left. And then we have different categories based on age. So our one to three year olds on the far left, all the way through adolescence and adulthood to 71 plus on the far right. There's a range of recommendations for each group and that's what those blue bars are. So there's not just like, hey, this is the magic number, but there's a range and that's what the blue bars are. And then the gold dots is what Americans are actually eating. And what we can see is that those gold dots, they're sagging really low. We want them up there on those blue bars. So there's not an age group or a gender that's hitting the recommendation. But what we do see is that vegetable consumption is actually lowest amongst boys ages nine to 13 and girls ages 14 to 18. So let's go back to that data around how are Americans eating currently? And let's see what we can learn about what they're currently doing so we can help nudge them in the right direction. Well, when we look at the data, what we see is that vegetables are consuming as the top two vegetables, potatoes and tomatoes. 21% of vegetables consumed are potatoes and 18% are tomatoes. But when we get that data, we're asking people how much potato or tomato are you eating in any form? which means that this form of potatoes and tomatoes is contributing to that 21 and 18% respectively, but we can look at these foods and know that they're not health promoting, right? The only other vegetables that Americans are eating in significant quantities, and, and even that is very low, is lettuce and onions. Um, and again, that's in any form. We also know that of the vegetables we eat, about 30% of them are eaten in something that we can, excuse me, they're eaten in something that we refer to as a mixed dish. So this is not just biting into a head of lettuce, but in a mixed dish, it could be lettuce on a sandwich, in a taco, onions in a casserole, those types of things. So when people report eating lettuce and onion in a mixed dish, this sandwich or this hamburger is considered a mixed dish and that could be how they're eating it. And then here we have our serving of, of potatoes. 60% um, of vegetables are eaten as a separate food item. When I think of a separate food item that's a vegetable, I'm thinking of like a handful of baby carrots. But again, looking at the data, a side item of French fries is also considered a separate item of consuming potatoes. Again, not necessarily in the healthiest form. And then the rest of the vegetables we eat are condiments. So thinking about maybe a side of pickles or a side of ketchup. All right, so we know how, how Americans are consuming the vegetables, but what we want is for several things. We want people to eat more of them, more vegetables, but we want them to eat them in nutrient dense form. We want greater variety. And let's keep in mind specifically those groups that are eating the least. So these are our teen boys and girls. Well, one strategy, since people like to eat vegetables as part of a mixed dish, 
is to try to slide more vegetables into the mixed dishes that we're eating. Some examples might be adding diced uh, mushrooms into hamburgers or meatloaf, adding an extra can of beans or maybe some diced zucchini into a chili or a soup, or maybe adding some canned pumpkin or shredded carrots into muffins, getting more of those nice orange colors, right? Another strategy is to replace refined grains or even meats with more vegetables. So this is an idea of shifting to another food group. Let me give you the example of the taco. Americans love tacos. <laughs> I know that we're getting them in, in our house um, on at least a weekly basis. In fact, Americans consume more than 4.5 billion tacos a year. That's 490,000 miles, which is enough to get you to the moon and back. So we love our tacos. So how can we use something people love to make some of these shifts? Well, for example, we could move some foods out in order to move veggies in. We could replace the shell with lettuce, whether you're making that a lettuce wrap or changing it to a taco salad. We could replace some or all of the meat with black beans, pinto beans, refried beans. And we could offer a, a ton of different vegetable-based toppings, maybe pushing out some of the sour cream and cheese that we like to put on top. And then one last strategy for the vegetable group is, could we offer vegetables at different times of day? So I think a lot of us just think of having a vegetable at dinner. Some of us maybe do an okay job getting them in at lunch, but what about breakfast? Um, so could you add spinach or tomato to your breakfast sandwich or to your eggs? Um, avocado to toast was really trendy, but if you like to follow um, some of the other food trends, and again, we're trying to hit those teen target aged. The sweet potato toast has become really popular. If you haven't heard of this, it's where you slice sweet potatoes and you put them in the oven long enough to make them soft and then you spread almond butter or something on top of that. You can even try to get creative by adding something like black beans into a brownie. Here's a really great resource for you. Um, this is posted, it's, it, well, first of all, it's a handout obviously titled 20 Ways to Enjoy More Fruits and Vegetables. It is developed by the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. The Academy is the world's largest organization for nutrition professionals like myself and is the leading expert in all things food and nutrition. You can go on their website, which is eatright.org to find evidence-based information and consumer-friendly material on their website. You just kind of print it and go, and you'll even see on the back side, which is on the bottom right corner, is a place for you to put your contact information in case you want people to reach back out to you directly when you hand it out. Let's talk a little bit about the fruit, fruit group. So the dietary guidelines recommend between two and a two and a half cups per day. But what we see is like the vegetable group, we're not getting enough. Um, we do see that toddlers, you know, sort of in that age of one to three in particular are doing well. I think this is because we serve a lot of fruit juices to toddlers. And as we wean kids off of fruit juice and we're trying to move them more toward whole fruit, we kind of fall off and we don't really ever rebound. Again, intake is lowest in girls ages 14 to 18. And in general, adults are not eat, meeting this recommendation either. When we do consume fruit, most of the time, two thirds of the time, we're consuming it as a whole unprocessed food, like an apple, um, but it could also be in canned or dried form. And a third of the time we're consuming it as 100% juice. Now, unlike the vegetable category, Americans actually have a wide variety of fruits they like. These are the most commonly reported fruits. And you can see it is a um, wide variety that we can work with. I think what we really need to do, instead of trying to get uh, focused too much on increasing variety, is just reimagining the way that we consume fruit so that people aren't just thinking, oh, in order to get fruit in, it means I need to eat an apple. Let me give you an example. Anybody ever been told this? I mean, especially if you work with a nutrition professional, right? They're like, why don't you just have fruit for dessert? And I'm gonna argue that nobody does that. <laughs> Um, because they're just not the same thing. But what if we uh, reimagined the dessert to be a fruit-based dessert so that we can have our dessert and make a shift toward getting in more fruits? So pears poached in wine sauce, peach cobbler, it's my absolute favorite, second only by baked apple, even grilled pineapple with some vanilla frozen yogurt on top. This allows people to have their desserts, but because they're fruit-based, we're helping them get more of that important food group in. 
Another reasonable shift is helping to nudge people in various ways. So maybe we could go from a fruit flavored drink to a 100% juice and eventually to a whole fruit. Or maybe we take a fruit flavored snack and convert it to another snack, but let's also keep in mind that it needs to be portable, it needs to be shelf stable, it needs to be something mom can keep in her purse, right, and have on hand. And also, we do consume a lot of fruits that are in syrup. So think about um, peaches and heavy cling. Is there a way we can shift that to something that is not soaked in syrup? So like peaches in light canned and light juice instead. Another example is fruit on the bottom yogurt. It's not really fruit on the bottom. It's fruit flavored syrup on the bottom. But maybe we could shift that to just regular yogurt and add fresh fruit to it. You can still put your fruit on the bottom if that's where you like it. And then piggybacking off the idea that Americans like vegetables in a mixed dish, could we add fruits to a mixed dish? So could we put dried fruits with some unsalted nuts for a snack? Could we put some canned fruit in Jello? Could we add car or raisins to carrot salad, Waldorf salad, broccoli salad, those types of vehicles? I'm a huge fan of carrot salad, some of my favorite foods, so. Um, and then I also think that we need to consider that Americans actually throw away a lot of the groceries they buy, which can significantly waste their food budget. And what we know is 40% of, about 40% of the food Americans buy actually ends up in the trash unconsumed. And the number one source of food loss is produce. Right? We tend to go to the grocery store, we're really excited to eat healthy, we overbuy fresh things, they wilt, you know, you pull that celery out of your vegetable bin and it's doing the wobble wobble thing and you're like, how can I use this? So we have the opportunity to help people recover some of that lost produce through some strategies. Um, learning how to store it more appropriately is one way talking to people about using canned and frozen alternatives. So instead of just buying fresh stuff, um, using kind of a wider variety and talking to people about, listen, if this is, if your lettuce is gonna wilt way before your bananas are gonna go bad, can you plan your meals around that? So here's a couple other resources for you. On the left, the Toss Treasures um, curriculum, also developed by the Academy Foundation, which is their nonprofit arm. And on the right, the Centers for Disease Control, um, fruit and vegetable campaign, used to be called five a day campaign, has some great resources for you as well. Let's talk about the grain group. The healthy patterns recommend we consume between six to six and a half ounce equivalents is what they're called. And an ounce equivalent is something like a half a cup of cooked grain, like cooked rice or oatmeal or a slice of bread. However, the recommendations are of those six to six and a half ounces, at least half of them are whole grains and not refined grains. And if we look at the number or the amount of grains that people are eating in total, it looks like for the first time, we're finally getting those gold dots on the blue bars, yay. However, when we break apart how much refined grains, so again, the white um, flour-based things, the white rice, white pasta, white bread, from whole grains, we can see that we're not quite there. So this graph breaks it apart and um, refined grains are the gold dots. We want those gold dots down on the blue bars. And the whole grain intake is the green diamonds. We want those green diamonds up on the blue bars. So we're getting enough grains in, but we're not getting them in in the right proportion. When we eat our grains, half of the refined grains we eat come from mixed dishes. Again, here's our burgers, our sandwiches, our tacos, pizza, macaroni, spaghetti. So this is really kind of bread, starchy based things. 20% of the refined grains we eat come from snack foods, whether they're sweet or salty. And 30% of the foods that we eat are eaten as a separate item. So think about a side of rice or a handful of crackers. The reality is though, Americans have a relatively good variety of whole grains that they will consume. So whole grain bread, oatmeal, whole grain cereals like shredded wheat, brown rice, even whole grain pasta. But before we talk to people about how they can replace refined grains with whole, whole ones, we need to first help people learn how to identify what is a whole grain. There's two ways that you can do this. 
The first is whenever you're looking at a food package, flip it over to the ingredients list and look for the word whole in the ingredients list. So for example, wheat flour and whole wheat flour are two completely different things. And we want the one where the word whole is in the ingredients. The second thing you can look for is this whole grain stamp. This is something that was developed by the Whole Grain Council. And what's nice is that they'll put it on the front of a package. So you don't have to flip that package over. And the Whole Grain Council in general has a lot of amazing presentations, handouts, and interactive activities. So I would check those, them out for some resources. Also, their resources are available in both English and Spanish. Another reason why people, I think, have barriers to including whole grains is the amount of time it takes to cook them. How many of you have ever tried brown rice? It takes forever. It takes like 90 minutes to cook brown rice. Well, most people are budgeting about 20 minutes for being in the kitchen. So that's really a huge hurdle to overcome. And the reason it takes so long, by the way, to cook that is because that um, fiber that's in the whole grain, it just takes a long time for the water to penetrate it and soften it up. Having said that, there are some quick cooking whole grains. So things like quinoa, which has become really popular, that is the word on the right-hand column that is starts with the letter Q. It's really hard for consumers to know how to recognize what quinoa is in the store because they're typically looking for something that starts with the letter K. Uh, bulgur and millet and even quick cooking oats um, are whole grains that don't take as long to prepare. So it helps people overcome that hurdle. And then there's some cooking techniques. So when you are cooking something like brown rice, you can batch cook it and then break it down into smaller portions and freeze it. And then you can just reheat it on your own time. You can also prepare them in a pressure cooker. So the Instapot has really helped people, I think, overcome the time restraint when it comes to whole grains. And then there are some convenience foods. So like on the right hand side, this is brown rice that Uncle Ben has made for us. And all we need to do is pop it in the microwave and reheat it for 90 seconds. Is that food going to be higher in oil and higher in sodium? It is. Does it help people experience quinoa and brown rice for the first time? It does. And if they like it, if they're like, yes, my family will consume this, then they might be more willing to invest in time to figure out how to make it on their own because they at least know what to expect from the product. And then when you are encouraging people to consume whole grains, let's think about cultural acceptability. So I'll give you an example. Um, I spent my high school years in New Orleans and everything is served with a side of white rice. And if you try to change out the white rice for brown rice, it's just not gonna happen. But if you put the brown rice in jambalaya, for example, where it's all mixed up and you can't tell, it's more likely to go over. If you're gonna put it in a stir fry where the sauce is gonna cover it and change the color anyway, again, more culturally acceptable. You can also try doing half-half. So you could do half whole wheat pasta and half regular pasta, one slice white and one slice wheat. That's the compromise I make with my kids, right? They want the fluffy white bread. I'm like, but your dietitian mom wants you to eat whole grain. So this is sort of our compromise. You can also, when you're looking at your breakfast cereal, just slowly throw in one or two extra handfuls of a whole grain cereal into your sugary choice. And then when you're thinking about options within this food group, can we make choices that are gonna be lower in sodium and lower in sugar? So for example, plain popcorn instead of caramel corn, an English muffin instead of a Danish, or a whole wheat cracker instead of um, like a processed salty cheesy flavored one. These types of shifts are really important because we do want to encourage people to lower their sodium intake. Sodium is the technical word that most of us talk about salt when we talk to consumers about um, salt in the diet. Sodium, the limit is one teaspoon per day from everything that you eat, and that translates to 2300 milligrams. Most Americans are consuming more than that. But so getting down to 2300 milligrams can be quite difficult, but the reality is if you're at risk for having high blood pressure or if you already have it, the recommendation is even lower. And most of us are at risk or going to have it. 90% of Americans are projected to have hypertension or high blood pressure in their life. So really working on getting people to move away from salt. 
unfortunately, when we look at this graph, what we're seeing is salt is in almost every single thing we consume. Most of what we're consuming is coming out of these mixed dishes, but it's in everything from protein foods, grains, snacks, beverages, vegetables, and that's probably when we're choosing the canned ones in particular. And the average intake for Americans, they're actually consuming about 3,400 milligrams a day with our men really getting a lot higher than that. Um, but again, the source is primarily processed foods. The good news is what we do find is that people aren't really getting in a lot of salt from home cooking. You know, even telling people like when my mom was cooking, the biggest mantra in her generation was don't use the salt shaker at home. But now people are cooking at home so infrequently, they're eating out a lot and they're using a lot of processed foods when they are cooking that we don't need to kind of beat them over the head about not using the salt shaker when they cook. What we need to tell them is cook, cook at home. And if you can just start cooking at home more, you're likely to reduce your salt intake. So this is again, one of the major benefits of the initiative that you all are taking on. Um, and we also know that even if you can't get your sodium intake all the way down to 2,300 milligrams, any shift in reducing your sodium intake lowers your pressure. So instead of putting the pressure on, and I hope you can see my air quotes, putting the pressure on getting your salt all the way reduced down, any reduction that you can make is gonna be health promoting. So there are a couple of academy resources that are available to help give people some snacking ideas that are gonna be um, more whole food based and lower in sodium. And these are available to you as well on the eatright.org website. Dairy intake, the recommendation is two to three cups of um, low fat or fat free milk per day or fortified soy milk which is nutritionally equivalent. What this doesn't include is things like unsweetened almond milk because there's not the same amount of protein in it. What we can see is that, again, Americans aren't really hitting this target except for our toddlers. When we ask Americans how they're consuming dairy, most Americans are consuming dairy as a fluid. So that means they're either drinking milk or they're pouring milk on their cereal and we're assuming they're drinking the milk out of their cereal bowl. Um, I have two images here. Uh, the left is like the pie in the sky ah, image of people doing the less sugary forms of these versions. And the probably more realistic version is the picture on the right. I am also going to argue that I think um, Americans might be consuming even less dairy than the data shows because it's a requirement of the National School Breakfast and School Lunch guidelines that they give kids the milk. We don't necessarily know for sure that they're consuming it. So again, a lot of opportunity here because there is good nutrition in these foods. About 45% of the dairy we consume is actually consumed as cheese. And most of the time that's cheese in a mixed dish. And the concern here is that cheese is one of the highest sources of sodium in the American diet. And I'm pretty sure my kids, by the way, are driving this consumption pattern of mac and cheese. They would eat it for every meal every day for the rest of their life. I'm, con I'm convinced if they could. But the concern again is the sodium content. Um, so how can we help people make some better choices here? Well, one of the things is, you know, again, can we get them to drink fluid milk instead of drinking soda, which is the number one source of added sugars in the American diet? It is unlikely, or even, you know, if we could get them to move away from, let's say, sweet tea or Gatorade or sports drinks, that would also be a really big win. I do think asking people to go straight from a soda to a glass of milk is going to be a little bit of a hard sell. But what if we did an intermediary step? Now, I would imagine that I'm the first registered dietitian that said chocolate milk might be a good choice. But here's the reason why. Eight ounces of cow milk has zero grams of added sugar, which is great. Chocolate milk does have added sugar. It has six grams of added sugar in it. It's part of the chocolate flavoring. But if we compare that to the same amount of soda, which is 27 grams of added sugar, at least that shift is saving a lot of sugar and increasing the nutrients, right? So there's protein and calcium in that chocolate milk. Just that one shift is gonna save you 21 grams of sugar. And here's a little bit of math for you. Four grams of sugar equals one teaspoon. 
So if we're saving more than 20 grams of sugar in that one glass, that's five teaspoons of sugar that we've just now helped that individual not drink, which is a great shift. Here's some other ideas. Um, we could use no added sugar as a yo no added sugar yogurt as a snack. So we saw earlier our, our nice picture of yogurt where we added fresh or frozen fruit to it instead of using the one with fruit on the bottom. Also, yogurt is an amazing substitute for things like sour cream in recipes. And that is actually one of the biggest talking points that we tend to talk about a lot as people are preparing their Thanksgiving dinners is making this shift. It's also important to help people move from regular cheese to lower fat cheese and to lower sodium cheeses if they can find it. Now, the reality is there's a lot of populations that don't consume dairy, whether it's for um, animal rights preferences, whether it's for lactose intolerance. So African-Americans and Hispanics tend to not digest lactose and milk very well. Breakfast, a slice of toast to... Somebody have a question about the toast? Or the breakfast? No, I was saying that's that sounds like a really good oh, breakfast sure. right there. Doesn't it? Kind of makes you hungry, right? <laughs> but the this handout right here is showing you that you can still meet your calcium recommendations even if you're not consuming dairy. Um, this example menu on the right gives you a thousand milligrams, which is close to the recommended dietary allowance. And this handout is available to you on the website on the bottom. This is a vegetarian subgroup of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. Okay, let's talk a little bit about protein foods. Protein foods is seafood, meats, poultry, eggs, nuts, seeds, soy, and beans. Um, lots of good nutrition here, but not all protein subgroups are created equal. However, when we look at the total amount of protein foods consumed, Again, those gold dots are, um, sorry, let me go back one. Um, there we go, total protein foods. Those gold dots are pretty close to the blue bars, meaning we're eating enough from these food groups. If anything, um, adult men and teen boys are overdoing this um, food group. And in particular, they seem to be, if we flip to this one, overdoing the category related to meat. And this is gonna include um, all meat foods like ground meat or ground beef, chicken, pork, also processed meats like hot dogs, sausages, ham, and luncheon meats. And the gold dots being above the blue bars, meaning they're over consuming, it actually is of health concern. And the reason it's of health concern is because higher, um, Dietary patterns that have more meat in them are associated with cardiovascular disease. And again, cardiovascular disease like heart attack is the number one killer of both men and women in America. In addition, there's um, some evidence that eating too much meat is associated with your risk of obesity, type two diabetes and certain cancers. And in fact, we do know that processed meats um, does increase risk of colorectal cancer. And the understanding of the hows and whys is so strong that um, processed meats has actually been classified as a carcinogen, just like um, cigarettes, because of the data that links its risk to colorectal cancer. Now, I will say the difference between cigarettes being a carcinogen and hot dogs being a carcinogen is that when people smoke, they tend to get a lot of cigarettes in in a day. The argument is that when people eat processed meats, they're not dosing themselves quite as frequently. I'm gonna argue, however, that they probably haven't been to the MUSC cafeteria to witness the fact that most people who eat breakfast there every day are getting a link, are getting a strip or two of breakfast every day, sorry, of bacon for breakfast every day. That is a pretty regular dose response. So we wanna to try to help people move away from um, that particular source of protein food Another reason is because those foods tend to be really high in saturated fats. Saturated fat is the kind of fat that is linked to heart disease, and it's primarily found in solid fats. So imagine, if you will, that you take a stick of butter out of your refrigerator and you slap it on your counter. It maintains its shape, right? That's what we consider a solid fat. It's almost as if it stays solid when it's in your arteries. 
Compare that to something like olive oil. If you were to take olive oil out of its container and slap it on your counter, it's gonna just run all over the place, right? That's what we call a liquid fat. Liquid fats, you can imagine, are more slippery in our cardiovascular disease system, and they don't cause as much clogging or damage. We want to move away from the solid fats um, and these saturated fats, and one of the biggest or best ways we can do that is to reduce the meat consumption. Well, what could we replace it with? We could replace it with seafood. We're really lucky where we live to have a lot of um, easy access to that. Other parts of the country, not quite as lucky, but no matter what group you're looking at um, or geographically where you're looking, Americans are not consuming enough seafood. Again, we want those gold dots up on those blue bars. And the reason this is, um, the reason the dietary guidelines have a specific recommendation for seafood is because it's been shown that um, seafood consumption can reduce your risk of heart disease. The reason why we think that happens is because seafood is rich in a type of slippery fat, like we were just talking about, called omega-3 fatty acids. And omega-3 fatty acids is what we think helps to reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease. The American Heart Association recommends that Americans eat seafood twice a week. And if you could do um, a serving two times a week, that would be enough for you to meet your recommended goals. Get enough of those heart healthy omega-3 fatty acids in order to reduce your risk of heart disease. Some people are concerned about eating um, fish because there has in the past been concerns around heavy metal toxicity or um, specifically high levels of mercury in seafood. But the benefit has been shown to outweigh the risk so heavily that a couple of years ago, the government actually recommended the advice to consume two to three servings a week of fish. They said it's safe enough and beneficial enough even that we're asking pregnant women to do it. So that's one of our most vulnerable populations, right? So if the government's gonna come out and say, hey, pregnant women, it's safe enough and good enough for you to eat, then that definitely can translate to the general public. What we know is that of the um, seafood Americans are willing to eat, 90% of them fall in this best choice category. And the best choice category means it's um, the least likely to have any type of heavy metal contamination. And when we, when we look at what Americans are actually eating, the top three things they tend to eat are shrimp, tuna, and salmon. So when you're talking to consumers about how to prepare seafood, I would start by talking to them about how to prepare shrimp, tuna, and salmon, because that's something that they already feel comfortable with. Well, what if you don't eat fish? Fish is one of the top eight allergens. So there's a large proportion of Americans that are um, allergic to it. There's a large proportion of Americans that don't have access to quality seafood. And then there's also um, groups like vegetarians who avoid it for other reasons. Well, it, for those groups, we still want them to get in their omega-3 fatty acids. There are some plant sources of that, flax seeds, walnuts, canola, hemp, chia seeds, and soy being the top ones. But if you're talking to um, somebody who is avoiding fish and specifically if they're pregnant, because that's really when we want them to get these omega-3 fatty acids in the most because it helps the baby's brain develop. This might also be a time where you want to ask them to seek out a nutrition professional such as a registered dietitian to help them come up with a more personalized approach to get in this nutrient. One of our protein subgroups is nut seeds and soy. And these are um, also great alternatives for the meat. So when we want people to eat less meat, these are protein foods they can eat more of. Um, Americans, as you, as you can kind of see here, they're doing a little bit better. They particularly do well with nuts. They specifically like peanuts, um, peanuts by themselves, peanuts as peanut butter, or sometimes they're consuming it in mixed nuts. And I'm gonna argue, unless you're splurging for the extra fancy can, you're basically buying peanuts when you're buying mixed nuts. The biggest thing we do want to caution people against is that nuts are really high in calories. So we want folks to watch their portions. About a quarter cup is what you want to limit yourself to. And if you can, try to find unsalted. This is um, the nut recommendation translates to about two tables of peanut butter plus two and a half ounces of nuts per week. Again, looking for those low salted versions if you can. 
What about beans, beans, the magical fruit? So they're actually in the dietary pattern for all examples as a subgroup of the vegetable category. Um, we're looking for one and a half cup equivalents per week. Vegetarians can also use them as one of their protein sources. Um, one and a half cups a week is essentially one 15 ounce can of beans. Gosh, that just doesn't seem like much, right? But if you look at the national data, look at that. People just aren't eating their beans. I do think this is going to be a conversation that's regional. For example, I think in South Carolina, we probably do better at consuming these legumes than maybe other parts of the country do. I also think it's cultural. I think there's gonna be some cultures that we really need to encourage them to eat more beans because they've just never really been introduced to it. Um, but this is another culinary opportunity that we have is to get people, hey, don't just make your hop and john on January 1, you know, what else can we do throughout the year? Um, some other suggestions just from that culinary aspect is, you know, we could try to include more beans in soups. So split pea soup and lentil soup is pretty familiar to people. Hummus, which is just ground up chickpeas, is pretty familiar. Beans and rice can, tends to be a go-to. And then there's a lot of ethnic foods that um, people are excited more about diversity in ethnic foods that are available. So edamame, which is the green soybean, tends to be popular in Asian restaurants. That middle picture is of a falafel, which again is ground chickpea that's um, been turned into balls and fried, and that's really popular Mediterranean food. And then of course we have the taco. We already know Americans love tacos, but can we put some black beans, pinto beans, refried beans in the taco? Um, I do ge generally want to talk on about Daddy. sugars. It's, yes. Before you move on from the yes. meats, um, we had a question from Amanda. Um, yeah. Could you go into a little bit more detail about what processed meat is? Yes. So I'm going to go back to that slide too. Thank you. Yep. Processed meat is going to be things like hot dogs, salami. Um, it does include luncheon meat. And that's one of my cautions around Subway getting that health halo is luncheon meat falls in that category. Um, bacon, of course, is going to fall in that category. It's anything that's been cured. Some people say, well, what if I choose turkey bacon? Well, unfortunately, the data is not robust enough that we can tease out the type of meat that's being cured to say, you know, turkey bacon is less risky than um, beef or pork. There are also some people that say, well, what if I get nitrate free? But the nitrate conversion is actually only one of about three mechanistic pathways that we understand causes the risk of colorectal cancer. So I don't think that's enough to really mitigate the risk of processed foods. Um, one of the theories is that it has to do with the heme iron. So heme is a molecule in our blood that helps to make our blood red. It helps to make dark meat dark. So like the difference between white meat turkey and dark meat turkey is a higher heme content. There might be something around the processing of what happens to the heme iron in the processed meat that increases the risk as well. Um, again, we don't know ex exactly kind of how we can differentiate between the choices in the grocery store yet. And so what we need to do really is just try to get people to move away from those, those foods more generally. I was gonna see, here it is. Um, what we do know is that it is dose dependent. So if we can even just get people to eat less of it, that is going to um, lower their risk. So it says here that it's 17% per 100 grams per day of red meat. So that's beef in particular, lamb falls in that category, but we don't eat a lot of lamb in America. And that's only about four ounces. And an 18% increased risk per two ounces or 50 grams of processed meat. And I do think that that's probably where Americans are over consuming more is the processed meat and where we have the greatest opportunity to help people scale back. So what do you think about some of the recent, um, there's a lot of, um, I know Applegate is one of the ones, they do like an uncured bacon and they do some uncured luncheon meats. You know, are those, since they're uncured, um, are those better or is it still something that we should prefer to avoid? I think it's both. I think, can you eliminate it? Where can you eliminate it? 
where, for example, when you're cooking, can you use less? So like if you're going to season your beans, could you use let could you use less of the ham hock or the processed meat or the bacon? And then if you have the option to substitute for a better product, can you make that substitution? So I think there's a multiple ways we can attack it. Yeah, and this is this is one of those tricky conversations to have with people as well. Um, you know, I think you showed very obviously but protein is one of the things that we tend to get pretty, pretty, we get enough. Right. <laughs> Some of us mm -hmm. get too much, especially in the meat category. Um, right. This is a really good opportunity to introduce some conversations about um, sustainability and 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 some of those conversations and and this is personal for me as as someone who grew up on a dairy farm and has raised her own animals etc. Um, here you can spend a little bit more on something that's a little bit better for you and eat a little bit less. Right. And, that, and that's a really tricky conversation to have with with people. But but it's it's backed up by the data that says, no, we're, we're eating plenty of red meat. We can take a step back and spend that little couple extra dollars on something that's uncured or something that's pasture <laughs> or something that's lower in in the saturated fat and 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 some things like that. Yeah, I agree with you. I do. And I agree that it's a tricky conversation. You have to meet people where they're at. So there are going to be some people in parts of South Carolina that they just, their grocery stores don't offer those options. Mm -hmm. There are going to be some families that they're really trying hard just to make ends meet. They don't have the couple extra dollars to spend on that. So really, depending on where they're at, you know, the great news is there's more than one way to approach this. Great. If that, if you don't have that available in your grocery store, that's not an option for you. How about if instead of having that meal twice in a week, what if we talk about using beans? What if we talk about exactly. reducing your portion yeah. sizes, things like that? So there are lots of different ways to talk to people how, about how to do this. I have me, a question I'm, for you. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, you're talking about cured and uncured uh, mm -hmm. for me. And I just noticed that yesterday I was shopping and I sort of noticed that. So yeah. uh, am I correct? I looked at the meat that I was looking at, uh, turkey bacon. And the turkey bacon, there was some said cured. Now, is that a mixture? Uh, am I correct? That's where they have made, created that meat and put, put the meat together in the way of processing it. It's not straight turkey meat, but it's meat that's been put together, created and put together. Is that correct for cured? So cured refers more to how they're keeping it shelf stable. So curing back before we had refrigerators, was awesome because then when you slaughtered a pig and you had all these slices of bacon, you could put it in salt, which would suck out all the moisture and then it would stay good through the winter, right? Cause you didn't have any way to store it. That's kind of the source of where we started curing meat. Um, now that's not so necessary, but of course we enjoy those products and they, they play a role in our diet. So the curing can happen regardless of which animal the meat is coming from, whether it's turkey or beef or pork. So you were reading basically two different things on your product. You were reading turkey as being the animal where it was coming from and whether it was blended with pork or something else, you probably have to look at the fine print on. Um, and the reason I say that is because turkey is generally lean unless they're grinding in like some of the skin and the dark meat and bacon tends to be a, a fatty meat. So sometimes they intentionally put pork in to fatten it up. Just like when you process venison, a lot of places will add fat from another animal or from, a, from another source because otherwise the venison is just too dry. So it sounds like your label was telling you, hey, this came from a turkey. And then this is what we did to the turkey. We cured it in order to give it this flavor, this you know, processing, et cetera. Does that help answer the question? Yes, yes, okay. thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. I just wanna cover sugars and then I'm happy to stay on the line for as long as you guys want to to talk about all of these food groups. I could talk about this all day, so I'm happy to do that. But the reason I wanna hit on sugars, it's not one of our food groups, but it is a nutrient of concern because people are overdoing it. The current dietary guidelines recommend less than 10% 10, 10 of our total calories come from sugar. Americans are doing, sorry, wrong way. Americans are doing more than that. We're doing more than 13%. So here's another picture where our gold dots are way higher than our blue bars and we want to bring them down. And it's concerning to me is look at who's overdoing it. It's our kids, right? Which means they're learning a habit now that's going to be harder for them to break. 
they're being exposed to this um, nutrient for a longer period over their lifetime. And um, it does lead to obesity and dental carriers, sorry, cavities, which um, we really want to be careful about with our children. If we look at where people are getting sugar from, sweets and snacks does make up a big category, but it's really drinks. So if, and it used to just be easy to um, pick on soda, but now it's fruit, it's fruit juices. There's my air quotes like high C and Capri Sun. It's things like Gatorade and Powerade. It's um, Starbucks drinks. Listen, there was this like pink unicorn drink that came out last year that my 10 year old was crazy about. I'm like, how do you even know about this? I think we're locked down in a quarantine, right? But she wanted it so bad. It has something like 40 grams of sugar in it. And there's people that drink these pumpkin spice lattes and, and sweet drinks all the time. And then of course it is sodas as well, which people continue to do. So again, anything that we can do to help people move away from drinks that have sugar in them is really gonna make a huge difference. We talked about a couple strategies when we were hitting on some earlier food groups. And I wanna encourage you to talk to people about how impactful one change can make. So this is actually from the choosemyplate.gov website that I was telling you about. They have a bunch of really cute videos on there. And this one is saying, listen, if you gave up one soda, one a day, and think about it, there's some people that drink, you know, three or four of them, and that could be their sweet tea in, in, in their well as well. If you gave up one of those a day for a year, you would save almost 20,000 grams of added sugar in your diet. So this is helping people take the long view. We want them to think about a, a change or a shift they can make that they can stick with. If they're drinking three sodas a day, you asking them to quit them all may not be something they can stick with over time. But giving up one, that does end up making a difference for them if they can hang with that shift. So helping people see what their impact will be over time, I think really helps people. Um, make some of those better choices. And then here's just two, two different uh, resources for you. The one on the left is from the same choosemyplate.gov. It's um, 10 tips to make better beverage choices. And the one on the right is from the CDC and it's rethink your drink. Gives people lots of great ideas. So as I just kind of summarized, we've taken a deep dive into these three example eating patterns and the nuances between them, but more importantly, how we can help people make shifts within these food groups, because if we come back to our original picture, all of that gold on this picture is kind of terrifying. We really wanna help the people where, who are not getting enough fruits and vegetables, et cetera, shift a little bit more so that that gold bar comes more towards center and we don't have quite as many people that are not getting enough of that. And again, for the groups on the bottom, we want to help people reduce the added sugar, saturated fats, and sodium in their diet. Sometimes the easiest way to help people visualize what this looks like in whole is to use the MyPlate, which again is the dietary guidelines in visual form. And the idea is that um, half of your plate, so that's the top half of the circle up here, is fruits and vegetables. Really trying to get those veggies in, think about those orange ones. Make sure you get a serving or two of fruit, which is our um, picture on the side. Only a quarter of your plate should be grain and we want it to be whole grain. That's quinoa right there if you've never seen it. And a quarter of your plate should be protein. That's actually a kebab made with tofu just to emphasize trying some new protein sources. And then trying to get in um, two to three cups of dairy a day, even if it's fortified soy milk, we're looking for some of those plant sources of calcium. Another way that you can think about it, um, this is by the famous food author, Michael Pollan from his book, In Defense of Food. And I hope that you appreciate, um, since you work in the library, that I'm using a, a quote from a book here. <laughs> but I love it. Eat food, not too much, mostly plants. I just think he should win like a Nobel Prize for taking all what we know about nutrition science and distilling it into this little short poem. Eat food, not too much, mostly plants. And when you're working with individuals about what it looks like for them, this is a question I get asked a lot, really making sure that we're tailoring um, our advice to the individual and to their individual circumstance. Because if we don't make it something that works for the individual, then they're not going to make that shift or they're not going to stick with the shift and then they're not going to get that long-term benefit. So in summary, this should be the handout that you have, but these are all of my tips for the different food groups that we went through. And 
in yellow is the um, handout that I referenced. I'm also happy to direct email any of those um, handouts to you guys as well. And I'm happy to go back to Q&A. I know we're right at the top of the hour. It's kind of a long presentation, but I'm happy to stay on the line for as long as you guys want to answer questions. All right, awesome. Thank you, Debbie. Um, we had another question in the chat about smoked turkey. Mm -hmm. um, Stacy, do you want to elaborate on that a little bit? Um, and then Glenna, yes, um, we will be sharing the recording um, and the resources. Um, those will both be available. Repeat that. I didn't hear you. We will be sharing. We will we will share the recording and um, the slides. We'll make both of those available to everyone who registered for the recording. Um, and then Stacy had a question about smoked turkey. Do you want to elaborate on that? Do you want to ask Debbie directly? And you're on mute right now. Stacey. I was talking um, about um, ham hock and and stuff like that, and I said with. Turkey be a best way of seasoning your beans or your um, stuff you oh, mm -hmm. instead okay. of using the ham hock or the um, yeah. Chicken. Okay, so I I actually have a couple um, non meat culinary tricks for you here, but let me ask you this: What is the flavor that you want the ham hock to contribute that you would be missing without it? Um. Well, I usually don't use ham hock because the because of the outer skin is tough. I quit using that years ago, but I started using okay. smoked neck bone, and uh -huh. then um, I used to use turkey, smoked turkey. Uh -huh. Okay, so is it the smoky flavor that you're really looking for? Correct. Okay, so I give you a couple ideas. Have you ever heard of liquid smoke? I have. Okay, so liquid smoke. Have you ever tried it? No. Okay, um, so liquid smoke is literally, they are smoking chips, collecting the smoke and distilling it into a liquid like water. Mm -hmm. And it is sold right next to Tabasco and hot sauce and stuff like that in the grocery store. Wow. And it adds that flavor. It's strong. So go a little tiny bit at a time when you first try it. And I would add it at the end, um, you know, toward the end of your cooking. That is a great addition to provide that flavor. Another great addition to provide that flavor is smoked paprika. I don't know if you've ever played with that. But that has a really great smoky depth. Um, pretty easy to find. There's lots of different paprikas out there. The, the one that we usually buy from the grocery store is by default what we call sweet paprika. So just make sure you're looking for the one that says smoked. Oh, okay. And then um, ancho chili and chipotle, which is in yeah. a can in like the Mexican um, foods grocery stores or even in the aisle like they sell it at the Harris Teeter in the Publix by my store I would try playing around with those three different ingredients and see if you can get some of the same flavor okay thank you yeah you're welcome anybody else well I, I appreciate going to stop the recording now Thank you all so much for um, taking time out of your day. I hope.